Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, depending on where you are. This is Catania Alvin and in London, about two miles from the city of London. And I want to give something different. It's been on my mind for some while because I've been reading Shelley Appin's Man and Mask. Shelley Appin was a very, very great bass singer of Russian peasantry and he was well famous. But he's in his book, he's written uh, the second part of it, In the Political and Revolutionary Whirlpool. Now, in our present day politics, we've got really a European Union in, that is doing its damnedest to bring people into poverty and push them into what I call close to communism and probably directly into communism certainly very strong socialism. Also in America there's a very strong push with the Democrats or certainly some of them to push America to become socialist. Now the Bolshevik revolution was pretty shocking and listening to his words uh, really made me realize from a personal level what the people suffered. There's a little bit here that I'm going to read to you and also to play some of Shaliap singing, an exquisite voice and beautiful expressive capabilities. So to start with, I'm going to uh, chapter one. This is of the, the second part, which is the revolutionary whirlpool. My wholehearted love of the theater, my disgust of all politics, a paradox which requires an explanation. If I have been anything in life, I have been an actor and singer. I have given myself entirely to my vocation. Outside the theatre, I have had no binding tie, no pronounced inclination. True, I took pleasure in drawing, but must regretfully admit that my ability was doubtful. I ruined many pencils and much paper in a ceaseless attempt to create new artistic makeup or stage pictures, and should be more natural and characteristic. Even my great love for the old masters had been no more to me than an echo of my passion for the theatre, where, as in painting, great work can only be achieved by harmonious line, glowing colour and depth of spiritual meaning. Politics have interest in me less than anything. My whole nature revolts against them. Perhaps this is the outcome of my small knowledge of worldly matters and of my ever-present desire at all times, in all circumstances, for peace, understanding and mutual sympathy. In my clumsy language, I have always declared that a man who can say to another with all his heart, Hail, friend, possesses the greatest knowledge, the highest wisdom, the most living religion. I am disturbed and made wretched by anything that stirs up division. It has always seemed to me that every man assumes a social and conventional uniform that does not, in reality, correspond with his nature or establishes dignity and superiority. It has always seemed to me as though uniform were in constant conflict with uniform and that to quell these conflicts one more uniform has been thought out that of the police. Religious disputes, international rivalries, patriotic boasts, intrigues and party quarrels have always seemed to me to be the negation of that which is most precious in life, concord. I have always believed that a man should be approached straightforwardly, not circuitously, and that he should be judged not by his breeding, nationality, or party opinions, but by his actions and ethical codes. He continues in his writing, My naive ideas hardly square with the no doubt inevitable need for party politics, and so these have always bored and disturbed me. To this day, even after the experiences I lived through in my years under the Soviet government, I am unable to consider the events that took place from a political angle, or to judge them as a politician. Humanity is all that counts in my eyes. Men's actions, good or bad, merciful or cruel, the freedom or enslavement of their souls, discord or harmony, 
These things, as I see them quite simply, constitute the sum of my interest. If roses bloom on a bush, I know it is a rose bush. If a regime fetters my liberty and imposes on me f fetishes that I am forced to adore, even though they sicken me, I disown that regime, not because it is called Bolshevism or anything else, but simply because my whole soul revolts against it. This attitude of mind towards life and men may appear anarchistic. I do not deny it. Possibly there is a grain of artistic anarchism in my composition. At all events, it does not arise from indifference to good or evil. I have always lived my life to the full. Many people will, no doubt, be surprised to learn that for nearly 20 years I sympathized to such an extent with the socialist movement in Russia that I considered myself almost perfect socialist. I remember distinctly the question I launched point blank at Maxim Gorky one night when we were walking on the marvellous island of Capri. Don't you think I should be acting more sincerely, Alexis, if I joined the Socialist Democratic Party? I asked, but I did not join it, simply because Gorky looked at me sharply and said in a friendly voice, You're not made of that mould. Listen to what I tell uh, Listen to what I tell you. You never forget it. Never join any party. Be an artist. In other words, be yourself. Nothing more will ever be asked of you. Here is Shalyapin singing um, the Massenet's Elegy. This was recorded in 1931. And I've missed out the obligato because I haven't got time, but I'll put the link in the description box and you will be able to listen to the preceding obligato. It's very beautiful.
Now, further on, he writes, the voice of the revolution spoke more daringly in literature and verse. Of course, Massenet's elegy was not of the revolution, but I played it because in that beautiful song, he uh, excels in his expressiveness. The voice of the revolution spoke more daringly in literature and verse. Books containing revolutionary sentiments were eagerly snapped up, and any verse and expressed revolt unloosed the public enthusiasm, no matter whether it was good or bad. When I was quite little, I learned the following couplet in the village school. Field, my field, my golden field, your corn is ripen in the sun. One day I went for a walk, a meadow stretched endlessly before my eyes, the corn was high, its yellow ears waved on long stalks. I was enchanted with the meadow, and when I got home I asked my mother, What is a field of gold, mother? A golden field, was all she said. A yellow field? No, golden, made of gold. There is money like that, made of shining precious metal. Who's got money? Rich people. Haven't we got any? No. Later on, at three o'clock in the morning, I heard the old moujaks groan as they left their rough beds and sigh as they took their scythes and reaping hooks for the day's toil. Why are they getting up so early? Why don't they go on sleeping? I asked again. They're going to work in the fields. What work do they do? They're getting in the harvest, the harvest in the golden fields. I realized that the golden fields were the source of much trouble and care to the moujiks. From that time onward, I was engrossed in the moujiks. On holidays, they got drunk. They swore at one another and fought, but they also sang songs. How beautiful they were, the songs of the moujiks. They sang of flowing rivers, of boats gliding along the Volga. They sang of the old man who beat his wife, and of the maiden who weeps because she is betrothed against her will. They sang of brigands, Turks and Tartars. They sang of Tsars, Ivan the Terrible, great lords and of great many dignitaries and merchants. All that I saw in the village gathered in my brain in a confused and oppressive mass I could not understand why life was so unjust. In the next part I'll share with you his encounter with the chief of police uh, General Trepov and at a concert that that uh, Chaliapin was singing in and it was a concert and he was singing a revolutionary song and the attitude of the chief of police is towards the words Bye-bye. This is Catania Alvin signing out, saying God bless, and I hope you've enjoyed this, and look out for the next one, because Bolshevism, communism, is very terrible, and Chaliapin experienced the terribleness of it as well. <laughs>